Hey, well, good morning. Uh, thanks, everybody, for being here today. Um, our first panel was part of Celebrate, and um, I'm really happy to have a good crowd here. Uh, my name is Nick Bowman. I'm an Associate Professor of Communication Studies over here. It's going to say West Virginia University, but that part's probably well known. Um, <laughs> And I've been on this panel for a couple of years now. This is a panel on outstanding tips from outstanding teachers. And one of the things that Celebrates tried to do for the last couple of years is bring faculty in who have been recognized in their career for their instructional excellence in, in some fashion. I mean, recognizing the sheer variety of um, instructional types, instructional moments, courses. You know, I'm thinking from the curriculum committee meetings and these other situations where the range at which we're teaching these different classes and different learners. So we've tried to mix it up a little bit on the panel with respect to uh, discipline, with respect to experiences. And one of the things we're gonna do today is um, we're gonna, we've already drafted a set of questions for your panelists for now. Um, and we figured for about the first 20 or 30, 35 minutes, we would have the panelists kind of dialogue with each other and myself on uh, ways in which we can think about instruction for our students here. And then I wanna reserve a good 20 minutes or so for Q and A from the audience. And so I say that now because it's important that you know the structure. We know it's an important instructional moment. It's also important if you know your role, right? I always tell my students that uh, when you're in class, you need to have a question, right? If you're absorbing information and, and you're processing it actively, you have something to say at some point during the, during the uh, discussion. So write a question down, because we want to try to open this up as much as possible to some Q&A from the audience, because I can only read minds a little bit to get the five questions here, okay? Um, when we do go to question and answer, I'll make, sh make sure to use a microphone because we are uh, web streaming this and we're broadcasting it elsewhere. So while we can hear you in the room, no problem, they can't hear you outside of Morgantown, okay? So with that, I will go ahead and jump right in. And with our first, um, first thing I'll do is have the panelists introduce themselves. So you have a sense for who's coming from where, what their background is. And it, it might be a bit bashful, but you know, some of the awards you've won, so we kind of have some context. And then from there, we'll jump into the first question, okay? Hi, I'm Gwen Berger. I teach in the Department of English, and I teach mostly courses like African-American literature, multi-ethnic American literature, post-colonial, and women's literature from the undergraduate through the graduate levels. Hello, everyone. I'm Pat Browning. I'm uh, an assistant professor at the Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering Department um, up on Evansdale. And uh, so I teach mostly uh, uh, introductory level aero uh, engineering courses, but everything up to uh, graduate level courses in, in uh, aerospace engineering. I'm Daniel Brewster. Um, I'm a faculty member in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology. I, I teach several courses. Um, one of the big ones is our Introduction to Sociology course, but I also teach pretty much all the controversial stuff. So um, social problems in contemporary America, sexuality in society, social inequality in the media. Um, I recently taught a, a co-taught a course um, with Dana Hebert Lima in biology on nature meets nurture. Um, and I also teach a sociology of health and medicine course. Um, yeah. Very nice. Uh, my name is Nicholas H. Goff. I am a professor of criminal justice at Potomac State College. Uh, my background is in law and as an attorney, uh, I teach numerous sets of subject matter, all undergraduate at Potomac State, albeit freshmen and seniors. Uh, introduction to criminal justice, criminal procedure, criminal law, criminal evidence, white collar, hate crimes, etc. So, uh, pretty, I guess, versed amount of law-based courses for our students. All right, thanks so much. And you know, if nothing else, um, there's an MDS degree on on this podium. So, if you're paying attention, I think the registrar is down the hall, and you can take care of that. Um, I'm going to start off incredibly broad because let's start where we're at. I want to ask the panelists, the way this is going to work is I'm going to pose a question. We're just going to go down the line, so to speak, for the first couple of questions. Just kind of prime the pump a little bit, and then we'll shift it over to the audience, okay? So my first question for the panelists is, what is your overall approach to teaching and helping your students to learn? And this is the broadest question I could think of. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we'll just start from the left here. All right. Um, well, my nine-year-old daughter um, developed her own list of questions and answers for me today, So, and I thought she was spot on, so I wanted to go with that. And 
her first one relates to what Nick said about having a question ready. So she says, you have to make your students feel like they can, and then she left a blank. So I was supposed to, you know, be able to put in my own idea and my own voice, but I thought, well, did you have something in mind for the blank? And she certainly did have her own idea. So on the one hand, she had an idea. On the other hand, she was making space for me to express my ideas. So what she had in mind was that you have to make your students feel like they can ask questions and express ideas. So I would say that's that's uh, one of my general approaches that try to open up a space where the students can ask questions and where I try to move through the material or the ideas that I want to work on um, by letting them take the lead with their questions, finding out what they're interested in, what they're confused about, um, what has you know, sparked their interest and in kind of going, going from there. Uh, I think another main principle for me is to help them work toward um, evidence-based arguments and reasoning so that even though they're expressing their own ideas it's not you know just opinion and they often ask in a, in a paper is this about our opinion or is this supposed to be you know an argument and I would say well anything you write is your opinion it should be your opinion but it needs to be um, evidence-based and well argued through critical thinking and critical reasoning and, and going back to your your sources and making a careful argument uh, so I guess if I were to sum up my teaching approach in general, it's it's uh, maybe three key words. One is simple, uh, the next is open, and then, and then the, uh, the final one would be adaptive. I, I try and be simple in my approach, not simplistic, but, but simple. Um, one of the biggest uh, barriers I feel in the STEM uh, teaching is, is technical uh, lingo. And if you can avoid that at all costs, that will help you you know, not snow the first group of students to just give up right away because they don't know what you're even talking about. So keeping things simple uh, is a good idea. Keeping the, the ideas simple themselves is a good idea as long as you can. Um, being open um, both on the upfront side, letting students know what uh, the objectives are ahead of time um, and, uh, and, and, and how we're going to try and uh, look at those objectives in relation to not only what you're doing daily, but weekly or, or monthly or, or the whole semester. Um, and then also how I apply merit. Uh, it's really important that you're very clear and open about how I'm going to award students for the work that they do. And that, that openness uh, gives us a, a culture of, of um, fairness that I think the students are much more willing to participate in if they feel like it's not rigged against them, right? Um, then the other thing is with, with being adaptive, one of the things I've discovered over, over the years is that, you know, I, I have five children at home. None of them learn the same thing, right, in the same way. And, uh, boy, when you go into a classroom for the first time, it's the most subtle of all the teaching uh, things that you have to deal with as a, as, a, as a teacher is you have to feel out the audience and figure out what is, you know, what is it that makes them tick and adapt to that. Uh, it's way easier for one person to adapt than for the entire rest of the audience to adapt, right? Um, and so uh, that may be, a, you know, I adjust the type of media that I use to present information. It, it could be anything, um, but being a, able to adapt is really important. Um, I think one of the, we all have had that experience with the ultra rigid professor who just did not want to change at all. And you, you, you know, we all know how frustrating that experience can be. And so uh, those, all those sorts of things help to make sure that my students are, are engaged as they can be. And they don't have the excuse to just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm done, I'm, I'm giving up, you know. So we don't want to give them that excuse. <laughs> um, one of the things I do um, from the start, I send an email to the entire class two to three days before class starts. It's essentially like a contract between myself and them. And so Nick said a few minutes ago about like being able to mind read for you. And like, that's actually one of the things I say in the email, like I can't mind read. And so I cannot know what you need. Um, and, you know, some of the same things that Patrick's saying, it's like, um, I teach, you know, mostly like 90 to 120 student classes. And so I think it's really important, um, or at least I've found it's really important to move, uh, you know, in, in ways that like, I'm not just teaching to a small group. And so 
um, one of the things that I do in my class, like um, in this agreement is essentially like, they're gonna be partners in the learning process. And so um, I never liked to lecture, right? So lecture has never been something that I necessarily enjoyed. And sometimes like I'm shocked when I walk by my colleagues uh, classrooms and they're like posted up behind the lectern and I'm like, like we're not teaching a class that you have to stand behind the lectern right and so like I can see if like you're literally in a in a 1980s classroom where you're still clicking the mouse and you know you don't have those kind of things but it's like get out in front and so um, one of the things that I do is I have discussions so everything and my my topics typically probably allow for that a little bit more than um, a lot of people, I mean, I can't imagine necessarily how you make um, certain subjects current. Um, and so one of the things that I do is, uh, you know, I'm constantly using examples from WVU, from Morgantown, from the state of West Virginia, from across the United States, but also around the globe and like things that like they relate to. And so when they hear this athlete's name or they hear this um, artist's name or they hear a TV show, they, they, they kind of get get into the same space that I'm talking about. And so I ask questions and it does lean and get me into some controversy from time to time. But, you know, when you ask people why things are the way that they are, it's like it's a sociological question. Right. So why are norms the way that they are? Why? Why do we believe that? You know, why do I believe my values supersede everybody else's values? Um, why are my beliefs, you know, so sacrosanct and other people's beliefs are, you know, you know, afterthoughts. And so, you know, when you're teaching those, those kind of, you know, lectures, it becomes difficult because people hear you saying those things, like, why is it the way it is? And they perceive it as an attack. And so one of my, one of my um, mechanisms is like asking them, how many of you agree with this? How many of you would say that this is true? And so kind of getting a, uh, kind of a quick poll of the class. Um, I constantly, my students write in my evals, like, you say high hands too much because they'll raise their hand like this. And I'm constantly like, high hands, right? And um, <laughs> every every semester when I get my evals, there's a good like 10% of them like, okay, we get it, right? But they don't, right? So, um, so speaking, you know, in ways that like we can actually see all the way around the room of 120 to kind of recognize that some people disagree with them. Some people agree with them. So. Daniel, one time I put up a diagram of a shoulder joint to explain <laughs> the full range of motion that's possible with the human arm. Very nice. All right. Um, Patrick said a few of the things that I wanted to say. That's all right, sir. Good for the soul. Uh, question being, what's your overall approach to teaching and helping your students to learn? Oh, my goodness. This is a loaded question mm -hmm. with a lot of answers to it. Um, the first thing that popped in my head was one step at a time. And that's really the first thing that popped into my head, literally one step at a time. However, uh, going back to what you said, project a path forward. I think you have to set that tone immediately as soon as you walk in the classroom. You have to set that tone of immediately as to what this class is going to be. The first thing I do in every single class that I walk into is make it very clear. I'm the teacher, you're the student. This is a relationship whereby I'm going to teach, you are to learn, we must work together. This isn't, you know, you are separate. This isn't static. This isn't compartmentalized. This is you and me together. We are going to work together to achieve an overall goal. Then they're like, well, what's the goal? Let me tell you. At that point, I try to break down for the students the overall purpose of the class. I try to break down for them the content, what they're going to be taking away. But what I really like to do is not only tell them the content as to what they're going to be learning, I want to tell them how they're actually going to use it. A lot of our students now are so very, well, what am I going to do with this? Why am I in English? Why am I in math? And, you know, questioning everything without a true understanding of the overall purpose of the learning itself and how it's going to benefit them in the future. And I think a lot of the times, if you lay it out for them that this class is vital to you or important to you, or this is how it's ultimately going to benefit you overall, mm -hmm. to an extent, you can pacify that nervousness or that incredulous nature on their behalf. And at that point, you can then engage those students and begin to build. Uh, as well, Patrick, you mentioned fairness. No doubt. 
when those kids walk in a classroom, I call them kids by the way, but when those students walk into that classroom, they need to understand very simply that they are all on even ground. I make every single one of them aware, I don't care who you are, I don't care what your background is, I don't care what your religion is, I don't care what your sexuality is, I don't care what your race is, I don't care. Every single one of you have a fair opportunity and chance with me, period, dot. At the end of this class, when you get your grade, golf did not give you a grade. That is the grade you earned. So look in the mirror. If you got a C and you're not happy with it, look in the mirror because that is the grade you earned, not the grade I gave. And I make them aware every single day I will walk into this classroom ridiculously and utterly prepared to teach you and educate you. Every day when I walk in this classroom, I am ready to go and we are going to move forward. I'm going to put in tremendous effort and tremendous energy, and I ask that you reciprocate. And I set this standard up front, and it is from this standard that we build. And every day I keep that promise when I walk in that classroom, forward with energy, no matter what. And I hope that that passion and that energy reverberates to the extent that they start to feel it and begin to engage themselves. But the hardest thing about the fairness, I'm going to come back to that for a second, is that fairness. I had a student this semester I had to fail. I did not want to fail that student. I did not. I liked this person. I was aware of their effort. I was aware of their dedication. But the grade was the grade was the grade. And while at the exact same time, there's that professionalism where you realize, hey, I can justify this in my mind. They didn't meet the score. Great. But inside of me, I felt, I was just like, oh my Lord, they work so hard. And those are the ones that break your heart. But the reality is, again, when you say, this is what you earn, this is what you get, that is teachers, that standard we must maintain. Because as soon as we favor one, our fairness and our objectivity is gone. And we're no longer looked at in the capacity as, what I want to say, fair. And that harms our reputation. It also harms the, or the student's perspective of us. And automatically at that point, we've damaged ourselves. So I think for me, when it comes to overall per, uh, approach to teaching and helping students learn, providing them a solid foundation, number one. Number two, putting the standards out in front of them, maintaining those standards. And number three, when I come to that class, I am ready to go. And I hope that they are too. Thank you. You know, a good theme through these, um, the notions of open openness and transparency, they're big discussions, you know, socially. Um, I do a lot of work in the social media and they're big, they're hot topics there. But it's an important reminder that a lot of times our students really don't know what they're getting into. So we get upset with them because they don't understand why they're taking this elective. But I mean, did we really understand why we were taking that elective when we were 18? I took Islamic philosophy. I didn't know why. Now, looking back, it's been pretty useful for lots of reasons. But when I was 17 at the time, it was just the class that was offered a three. So I think it is important for us to <laughs> you know, let them know why we're there. So I appreciate those themes. Um, to kind of advance our panel through and recognizing that a big part of Celebrate uh, here at the university is innovation, it is trying to not simply repeat pedagogy and sort of repeat the things that we have definitely discussed in the past, but talk about where we're doing it different perhaps and, and one of the things we could argue is that for the the panelists you know one of the reasons that they have been recognized in their teaching although we're all too bashful to talk about our, our cvs but if you look at these you'll see the those recognitions is innovation and so i want to turn the panelists to talking about two sides and so i want to ask you about any particular innovative i, I like using a nine-year-old, that's a good one. It's a really good one. Um, any innovation strategies that we've seen work, but I also want you to speak to failure. For those you've heard me speak before, it's one of my favorite topics. Maybe I said something about me, but can you also tell us time that your innovation did not work so well? So what worked and what didn't? And I'll just go ahead and start maybe at the other end so that you don't have your words taken from your mouth this time. Sorry, oh, back to me. Um, Innovation involving the students and their learning. Um, we've heard it before, and I guess I'll fall back on pedago uh, pedagogy. I'm sorry, Nick, uh, but uh, the student-centered learning is probably some of my uh, favorite tactics that I like to implement in my courses. Um, 
as a few examples. Uh, I had the students, uh, I created a technical writing course, and that's my failure, by the way, but um, not, the, not the technical <laughs> writing course, overestimating writing skills, that was my failure, but uh, I created a writing course, and the objective is, how do you teach students to write a police report? How do you pull this off? Well, I've tried a few strategies. Uh, number one, I actually had students commit a uh, crime against me in class once. I set up the entire class, and they had no clue it was coming. I had organized everything. I even told campus police in case somebody called 911. I'm not making this up. I cleared it with administration, and I honestly had a student come in, get in an argument with me, and ad lib. We've already prepared the argument, and he physically assaulted me. Now, it sounds a little crazy, I know, but I allowed him to do it and we engaged in full-blown criminal activity in front of the students and their jaws dropped. They were blown away. And as I was laying on the ground, I looked over at them and I said, okay, write notes of everything you just saw. And they were like, oh, you just set us up and you can see it. But their notes and the notes that they used to draft their police report, oh my gosh, were they detailed. Those were some of the best details that I think I've ever seen. They paid attention to his height, his weight, what he was wearing. He had a Chicago Bears t-shirt on. They even got that down. You know, they were even how far the distance he hit me. Um, mind you, he didn't hit me, hit me. He shoved me in the chest and pushed me backwards. But at the exact same time, it was one of those things where it's like, how do we stimulate the learning? And I put myself at risk in that instance. Don't worry. He was a very good student and uh, he was not going to hurt me, but at the exact same time, we needed to make it lifelike. Well, rather than sacrificing myself each time uh, through that innovation, I developed a technique. My wife is a former Maryland State policeman. And I said, sweetheart, uh, please give me uh, as many interesting scenarios as you can that you had to investigate. So she started popping off these interesting scenarios, everything from drive offs to gas stations, not full-blown crazy, just simple scenarios, like a drive off from a gas station. And what I did was create characters. And now to have the police reports, I created full-blown stories where there are three separate characters, victims, suspects, witnesses, et cetera. And all the students play a role. So every student has to role play a certain character and then every student has to act as a police officer. And they must go to these persons and literally interview these persons and extract information from these persons from which to develop a police report. So they become active participants in this and everyone has to be a police officer. Everyone has to uh, as well role play their characters. And I give them tremendous leeway in playing their characters. I allow them to lie. I allow them to manipulate. I allow them to twist and bend their characters. I want to keep it as real world as feasibly possible. And in real world, when somebody's talking to you, especially criminal, they're usually lying. So I allow them to lie. And the objective of the police report is to extract as much information from these persons as feasibly possible and then draft a police report from this information. And the interesting part about the class is this is just step one. After they extract this and create this and having to work together to pull it off, once they do this, then they have to do a legal writing assignment and finally a corrections writing assignment where I take them through the entirety of the process of the person being not only arrested, but then processed through the entirety of the criminal justice system. And all the time working with each other and having to work in groups to extract the information, again, to keep it as real world as possible. Uh, it's probably one of my biggest successes. My students love that project. They absolutely love it. Uh, biggest failures, I don't want to take too much time here, but biggest failures, overestimating writing capability. Uh, one year in a freshman course, I uh, provided a term paper, APA citation, APA reference, APA style, et cetera, et cetera, five sources, da, 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 da. And when it came back, I was like, oh, dear God, what did I just do? Uh, if red ink was blood, I was dead. And this was when I was a brand new teacher, brand new professor. I had no inclination, the lack of writing ability of a lot of our students, none. And in handing out this assignment, when it came back to me, it became transparent and it became clear. And it was at that point that uh, my counterpart and I chose to develop a writing course specifically for our major 
to enhance and improve those writing skills of our students because I'll be just blunt, they were deplorable. And I had learned how APA citation in eighth grade. And having been out of school for so long, I didn't realize that a lot of the students were not trained nearly to the extent they need to be. So we had to remedy that situation, but that was probably the worst project that I think I had ever implemented. So that's just me. Thank you. So I have a list of failures. Uh, <laughs> like, it's funny because <clears throat> I was told once by someone that I was one of the youngest faculty members ever hired here. It's like, I'm not that innovative. I'm not that young at, at, my, at my core. Um, I actually wish things were the way they used to be in many ways. So like one of the things I put on here, so last semester, I thought that it would be innovative to not use PowerPoint and instead use the chalkboard. Um, <laughs> And it was an absolute failure. Um, and it was in my sexuality class, but it was it was in a way that the lectures, the discussions were a failure in some ways, but it definitely required them to read. And so every day they were reading between probably 20 and 35, 40 pages of um, journal articles. Um, instead of coming in there and just essentially giving them all the information so that they don't read, we were using the board. And so I would write like words on the board um, from these and then we kind of work through the board. And it was very similar. You know, none of these, I wonder if there's ever anything that's innovative anymore, right? As opposed to, you know, I, I've seen people take credit for things and I'm like, I had professors that did this in the 90s. Like, <laughs> this is not innovative. And they win awards for this innovation. And I'm like, okay, sure. Um, um, but as we look at this, like one of the things that I do is um, I, I lead a study abroad. Um, we, it's a sociology of health and medicine course. So obviously with the School of Medicine, all of our, our medical um, professionals, dental professionals, all of these other individuals, part of the MCAT has become about sociology and psychology. And I think probably everyone that's been to a doctor in the last probably five years can can say like these people have no understanding of how to interact with humans right and so the nurses do probably a lot better than do the doctors or the dentists but um, and so what we do is we run medical and dental clinics with an international uh, organization um, and it's everything about sociology is put into the course so they have readings um, it's I relate it back to Appalachia um, you know one of the big things <coughs> here uh, you know WBU is this idea that it was a land grant institution. All of these students are going to go to WV School of Medicine, and ideally, they're going to work in Appalachia. And the reality of Appalachia, I grew up in Appalachia, is that um, in many ways it rivals resource reduced regions of the world, right? So, like, I so I took the students to Panama a few years ago. Panama was better than Appalachia, in my opinion. Um, Nicaragua wasn't, Honduras wasn't, Ghana wasn't, but you know, and so a lot of these people want to teach in those those um well they want to do medicine or do you know uh, clinics in this area so it's nice to be able to relate it back to you know the area that we're from one of the things i do so my courses like i said are inequality based and so before we start that section of the course um, whether it's race class gender sexuality um i give them a pretest where i ask them to tell me uh five to seven ways in which men experience inequality in contemporary america five to seven ways in which uh, women experience inequality in contemporary America, five to seven ways in which, which transgender people experience inequality in contemporary America. Do the same thing with race, do the same thing with class, do the same thing with sexuality. And it's incredible um, the number of them that can't come up with anything for how the more privileged group experience inequality. And so we kind of beat them to death with this idea of like women experience this and trans people experience this. We don't talk about the way in which men experience inequality because obviously women experience at a much higher level and a much higher degree. But like I think that it's important for me to teach them on a way that lets them realize that they do too. And so particularly with privileged groups, a lot of them dismiss the ideas of prejudice, discrimination, inequality, etc. But then when I tell them that they also experience, they suddenly believe it. You know, and so when I tell my male students that you're very unlikely in a divorce to get custody of your 
children, even if you're an outstanding citizen or whatever, when I tell my male students that you're much more likely to get a differential application of the law than are the female students, they're like, oh, okay, I believe inequality exists now, right? And so once they understand, I also leave the classroom as much as possible. And so I'm known for teaching out in um, the green of life sciences. I'm known for um, teaching on the on the mountain layer green where, <clears throat> You know, I'll tell them in advance, bring your bring your notes. We're going to do activities outside the, the classroom. And so one of the activities I do is like this deviance activity where they all get on a line. And this is not innovative. It's been done for, you know, probably hundreds of years. And get on the line, and then I stand, you know, at the other side of the, the yard, and I'm asking them, you know, take two steps forward if you have a 4.0. Right. And it's like they don't think of like positive deviance. And so mixing in both positive and negative to kind of see at the, you know, at the end of a 20 point question where they are. And so I have a ton of failures. I don't really have a lot of successes on innovation. <laughs> uh, so I guess uh, I, I have just one quick specific innovation I use in my STEM class, and, and that's uh, utilizing um, smartphones in the classroom. Um, there's a lot of. Uh, software out there, some free, some not. Um, they're ubiquitous now. There's no, uh, I, I worried for a long time that adopting uh, use of smartphones in the classroom would alienate certain people, but I would year after year ask Does anybody in here not have a smartphone. And eventually I just gave up asking that question because I never saw a hand go up. Uh, so I use that and I use that to just really quickly check some key concepts during the, during the lecture. So I'll throw a, a question up on the online service and have them quickly answer within a minute or less. I, I know whether they got what I was trying to pitch. Um, and, and if they didn't, then I can stop and fix it right then and there rather than having to deal with it later on in the exam and realizing they didn't get it you know, way later. Um, so that's uh, one innovative strategy I found that is actually quite successful. Um, don't be afraid of of utilizing that and, and in fact I'll even say this that because they're so used to learning on this platform um, that you're actually hitting them you're, you're doing sort of a double task you're hitting them where they learn anyway so they've already got the neural pathway there for it and you're actually displacing whatever else they would be doing with it in your class anyways right so um, so that's an innovative strategy that I think really does work and there are free systems out there that you don't have to charge and students don't have to pay um, then I can tell you that, uh, and, I, and I will still fail in this, I'm going to keep failing in this, I, I guess it's just a failure of mine that I'm just going to have to learn how to be used to, but I, uh, as an engineer, uh, I, I like to challenge my students with very open-ended problems, um, which students, as we've sort of alluded to here a little bit already, students don't really like to get open-ended problems, um, where there's no cut and dry solution and they really have to scramble. Um, and one of the things I think that is a, a mode for the failure is that it, it does immediately cause them to feel like, well, I can't, this is not solvable. Um, and then they sort of check out, they give up. Um, but I do it because I, I give those really widely open-ended problems uh, as long-term, semester-long projects typically, or even mini projects, because I'm trying to get them to that last stage of Bloom's taxonomy, you know, where they're creating. Um, and that's about the best way that I can get them to create is by giving them something very open-ended where they don't, there's no good answer. And I'll even tell them up front, look, I don't, I don't have the answer for this. You've got to pitch me the answer and, I, and we'll see whether it's right or not. Or, or, you know, we'll sort of decide as a class even together whether your, your answer is right. Um, but those typically fail a lot um, because the students just, uh, they feel overwhelmed. Um, there's some things you can do to mitigate it, you know, make milestones and things like that. So you sort of push them along, nudge them along, but eventually they have to, it's open-ended, they have to come up with a solution on their own. And so a lot of times that fails. But again, I, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm okay with failing uh, on that one. I, I just don't make it uh, worth a lot on their points at the end of the, at the, end of the semester. So. And as we shift to Gwen, get your questions ready, because I'm going to yeah. turn the microphone over, okay? That's good. Um. <clears throat> I would like to talk about, I guess, both some failures and what I hope are successes in a particular course that I teach, which is an, um, a women's literature course, and I title it Bad Girls, and 
part of that was because I was always emphasizing um, being, you know, being rigorous and analytical and critical thinking, and also because I was teaching um, topics with uh, racial difference, gender difference, sexual difference. I was always asking students to um, approach things not from a point of personal experience, because they didn't want to just draw on their biases or their preconceived notions. I wanted them to understand people who were different from themselves. But that was really kind of working uphill mm -hmm. because um, people want to relate, right? They want things that are relatable. They want to think about themselves. So I was always kind of working against the students in some ways. And, um, and so I decided that, you know, I didn't always have to make everything so damn rigorous, you know, <laughs> that like you could just make something kind of fun and interesting and approach it, approach it that way. So um, on the first day of class in my women's lit class, most of the students don't know that it's about bad girls because that doesn't show up on the, you know, in the course catalog or they think we're just going to talk about you know, whoever the latest celebrity bad girl is, like a Kardashian or something, you know, and it's not, so sometimes um, it's a little bait and switch, you know, because the course <laughs> isn't really about about that. But I go in on the first day of class and, you know, they don't know me, they don't know anything that's going on. And I say, okay, what are all of the words for bad girls and women that you know? And I write them on the board. So going back to the blackboard, I just stand there, I'm like, what are, what are all the words? And at first, they're just kind of shocked and silent. They're like, can we really say this? In class? <laughs> you know, and then somebody will say, cunt, you know, and I'll write it on the board. And we just go through all the words they can think of. And this is also how I find out all the latest slang, you know, so I'm not always <laughs> behind. There's always some new ones I haven't heard of. And then I tell them some of the archaic ones they've never heard of. Um, and then after, and then, so we, you know, we, we finish all of that. And I'm like, okay, what are all the words for bad men? And it's crickets, you know, and we don't have a lot of those kind of slang words and insults and epithets. And um, although there's some more new ones that I hadn't known before. <laughs> and then I go back to, you know, we have this, you know, three quarters of the board, you know, at least taken up by the words for bad women. And I'm like, okay, well, how do we group these? How do we categorize these are what, are, you know, do they have anything in common? And of course, it turns out they're all about sex and power and the relationship between sex and power. And, you know, that's a way, I think, of taking this idea of gender roles in our society and how gender is constructed um, in, in a way that's kind of incontrovertible, right? Because it's just like the lists of, of words, it's the vocabulary. Um, but it's it's kind of relevant and it breaks the ice. And then from there, the next assignments that we do, we look at, um, actually the next assignment is a, a kind of historical cultural studies academic essay about conduct manuals for women in the in the 19th century in the United States and um, and and the, the cardinal rules of true womanhood. So we go back to a kind of more rigorous approach and then we you know move into different kinds of academic texts. And then um, something that I've you know kind of innovated at the end of the semester. So one of my failures is that I tried to get students to debate like once or twice. I was like, okay, they're not like you know taking a, a stand on things and you know they don't have opinions or they're not talking in class. So I tried to set them up, you know, to to have debates about, you know, for example, once Thelma and Louise, you know, so Thelma and Louise, the movie from what, 1991 or something, and it um, occasioned all of this, you know, kind of public cultural outcry because you have um, women outlaws, you know, in, in a movie. And even though it, it was very conventional story of like a road story or an outlaw story. People hadn't seen women in this kind of a role before and people said, this is terrible because women are violent, they're gonna learn how to be violent and this movie is stereotyping men and it's just awful. Um, so I just, but they hate, they hate debating. They don't want to be um, in conflict with each other and that's how they saw it rather than exploring ideas. Um, so now what I do at the end of this course, and I've, I've tried it in other courses too, is that I have them perform, write and perform a prose poem in a, or it's like a prose poem or an essay in a poetry slam format. And 
They are supposed to take the terms and concepts and ideas and texts we've looked at all semester and apply them to something in their own experience or their own lives or something that's currently in society. So instead of working against their experience, I try to get them to think about how to make their own experience relevant to others and relevant to a larger audience. And um, we look at lots of examples or models of um, performance poetry online. And in the, in the bad girls class, I have them read essays uh, by Roxane Gay from her collection, Bad Feminist. And Roxane Gay writes amazing essays where she kind of starts from a personal position and then, you know, moves out into the world and really uh, kind of demands action from her reader. So she has a very short, brilliant essay about privilege, you know, and the students, like, they're kind of tired of hearing about privilege. They've heard about it a lot. But she starts off talking about how it's difficult for her to recognize and accept her own privilege, even though she doesn't come from the most privileged background. And she says, you know, well, we all have it. All you have to do is acknowledge it or recognize. If you're reading this, you have a book, you're privileged. Um, but then she says, but you could use your privilege to make a more just, better world. And so she moves from the I to the we to the you. And we, we kind of look at, at that essay, how she takes a personal, you know, starts with the self instead of lecturing somebody else, but then moves out to how to make this relevant to others. And um, the students, when they hear they're going to have to get up in front of the class and, you know, perform this, this prose poem, they're terrified. They're absolutely terrified. And, and yet it has brought out um, just, you know, the most amazing, amazing um, essays and stories and people have talked about um, domestic violence, they've come out in class, they um, have talked about uh, poverty, you know, and, and, and they do it in these, you know, incredibly moving and creative ways. So instead of kind of pushing them into this constant um, analytical frame where they feel like I'm kind of pushing them into a, into a template, you know, they have room to be creative and to express themselves, but to do that in a, in a responsible way, in a sense. And I, I use, they also have to write a reflective essay where they write about their strategies, their rhetorical strategies in their prose poems. So we use the, the PACT model that the Everly College uses of, um, for writing of um, purpose, audience, conventions, and trouble spots, so that they're always thinking about what's their purpose, who is the audience they're trying to reach, how are they trying to reach that, that audience. So that has been my innovation. Thank you. And you know, these, um, as we turn over to the audience, first, we're almost exactly to the minute on time. It's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> second thing is that, um, you know, you talked about openness in the first round of answers, and the second ones, I think, strike a chord with innovation that you can make um, teaching a moments that are a bit more personal. Sometimes we think that it's either experiential learning or classroom learning, and those are the two kinds of learning. But everything I feel like you talked about at some level is making that lesson in the room a bit more open and real without it being a straight simulation of going somewhere else. I'm thinking in particular of these uh, poetry slams and of the open and engineering problem. My buddies who are engineers are never given a problem with a solution. That's their entire job is we, we need this to work and we're gonna pay you until it doesn't work anymore, right? So I want you to think about the innovation broadly oftentimes is about creating that um, almost lived experience that doesn't have to be a, a straight simulation of reality but can just borrow slivers from what your students bring to the class. And I think what uh, Daniel and Gwen talked about a lot is letting them kind of bring their own experience a little bit in ways that they probably don't even know they have an experience. That's that's kind of like our flashlight model. And so that's a really neat thing to pull away from innovation. So with that, I always have questions, but I'd like to turn it over to the audience questions. There are some microphones going around, so please wait till the microphone comes to you. And we can go till about five till, I think, maybe time for the next sessions. Hello. Um, I just wanted to uh, address a couple things Nick said because uh, I really loved his approach. Uh, when I was in high school, we used to reenact historical events. We had uh, a reenactment of the stock market crash where each of us played a role 
And then we all knew the stock market crash was coming, but we never knew when, and we never knew whether what we were doing was gonna help us or hurt us. And that was exactly the feeling people had in those days. So uh, role playing is a great idea. Um, but um, Nick's idea of reenacting a crime, I have to say that's not entirely innovative. Um, a character in Ironside in a 1970 episode uh, went to the police academy and they did the same thing in that episode. <laughs> but it was a great idea then, it's a great idea now, I think. The other thing is about writing. You know, Nick was saying uh, that there really is a, a lack of writing skills and that he had to create a course to address that. Well, I'll tell you, we have the same problem in STEM because the students uh, take English 101 and 102 and they're taught how to write a persuasive essay, and then they have to get to a science class and they cannot write a lab report because they don't know how to write a scientific, factual report. So they write a lab report, I did this, I did that, because that's all they knew. I mean, they didn't, they aren't focusing on the information, they focus on how they felt when they were doing the experiment. And so uh, we really need a version of English 102 or some equivalent course for technical writing for scientists. And we don't have that. I don't know if they have something like that here at, at Morgantown, but we don't have anything like that at Potomac State and we really need it. But uh, I haven't really gotten much uh, support in when I suggest doing that. But I really like your ideas, Nick. I am intrigued by the amount of uh, freedom you allow your students in your classroom. I have tried it some, I teach math, so. <laughs> um, my question to all of you, um, do you experience several, uh, various levels of discomfort when you let go of that control and you let students run the classroom and how do you um, avoid the runaway train? <laughs> I mean, I think for me, like, I don't think the students ever run the classroom, right? And I don't want them to think that they're, they're in charge, right? Like, like I'll stop, you know, I will, I will stop them literally when I, the first time I think that the train is going somewhere, right? I'm like, okay, what else, right? And like, I'll completely like, and I think for me, it's caused a lot of problems because what it does is it, you know, it alienates that student where they're like, okay, he just dismissed me, right? You know, but it's like, at the same time, it's like there are just so many comments that I hear in my day-to-day -day teaching that it's like, I'm not even going to, like, give it a response, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like this semester, one of my students called me a black <clears throat> supremacist. And obviously, I didn't know what that meant, right? <laughs> um, and then he told me that, like, every class is like a black supremacist meeting. And I'm like, we've been talking about race for, like, 20 minutes right like we haven't talked about race for the last 10 weeks but like that's what he heard right and so as soon as he said it i was like okay and then like i just moved to a different section of the room uh i, I was sorry no, uh, no. I, I would say one of the things that i do when i sense that that kind of thing is going on particularly if it's related to handling project issues for example uh, we're, we've got those open-ended projects and there's, and there's debate going on in the classroom that's kind of getting out of control, is I just try and institute the same things you would see in the in a professional industrial world of, of engineering where, okay, you guys have to sideline this and have a meeting and figure out what you're going to do and we're not going to take class time to do this. Um, or the other thing you can do is you can shift uh, the, uh, the venue for such things to, uh, again, I bring up the smartphone thing, uh, and Gwen, actually, uh, you were talking about doing debates in class, and one of the things that I do, we have to handle ethics as one of our ABET requirements, right? And so uh, what a lot of times what I'll do is I'll actually, so in some of these uh, uh, smartphone software tools, you can actually use um, sort of like forums, forum-style debating where people will, you know, put up their opinion about some ethical condition, and then people can thumb up it or thumb down it, you know, and, and so that is a really efficient way. It doesn't take up a lot of classroom, but you know, people are operating in the, in the mode that they're familiar with, actually. So. I'm not sure how it would work for math, but I, I feel like 
my classes are not so open in, in a lot of ways. And I think one way that I, and sometimes I wish I were more comfortable with a little more, you know, chaos or disorganization or just putting stuff out there when I don't know what's going to happen. But I really ask students to come back to the text and stick to the text. So um, whether it's a creative text or a critical text, you know, if they have, uh, you know, something that they assert, I'm like, okay, well, what's your evidence? Where, where do you find that? What's that based on? And, you know, so we're not just having kind of free-floating opinion discussions where you just pull in, you know, anything that you happen to think about these very controversial topics. You have to, you know, back them up and you have to deal with, you know, the arguments in front of you. And I think that by modeling, you know, a certain kind of, you know, civil debate and discourse all semester, like by the end of the semester, they know what to do. They don't want it to go more out of control and and they they feel like they have a model to work with. That's where I wanted to go. Model the civil debate, civil debate and discourse. That's exactly it. And um, in law courses, I want students to think from a 360 degree perspective. I want them to take positions that are antithetical to their morals and their ethics sometimes. I want them to think completely outside of the box and I want them to be able to posit said arguments convincingly and with support of evidence. And in doing this, what I do in the very first day as well is make the students aware we are going to engage in civil debate and in discourse of controversial topics inside of this subject matter. And the way this works is very simple. You may not like what somebody says, but you will respect it. If it's out of line, I address it, not you, period, dot. If you got a problem with that, there's the door. And I set down a very hard line. And then what I do with the students is then slowly but surely model that civil debate and discourse with them to show them that you can disagree respectfully and professionally and how to engage in that. And just like what you said, by the end, they already understand it. As long as you model it, as long as you practice it, as long as you can control it, they will allow themselves and they will police themselves in having that civil debate and discourse as to that subject matter. And with luckily with my students, because I get them over four years, if I train this freshman year, at this point, sophomore, <coughs> junior, senior year, I can a lot of times just back off and watch them go and facilitate. And when I assert my authority to come back in, at this point, they're so trained, they understand, okay, time to back off, time to learn. But it's, I think, setting that atmosphere through time and through experience and setting your expectations immediately. You know, the question's a really good one because we have to always remember that there are trade-offs. And if you go towards an open course where you're pulling in student experiences, well, now it's an open course where you're pulling in student experiences and you cannot make the assumption that you're going to like what you get mm -hmm. and you do lose a bit of flexibility. It's that shift from the sage on the stage sort of mentality where <laughs> this is where the rails start to go off. But I think this notion of modeling is one you're going to hear in a lot of these discussions that I hear it with smartphones, for example. If you don't like what your students are doing online, one of the best ways you can correct that is show them how to use it in the way that you would think is proper. And you would be surprised the extent to which they will stop shopping if they know that their exam scores will go up if they use the forum to discuss their engineering issue. I think we have time for one more question, if someone has one, okay? And if you have to go to the next session, we understand the doors aren't locked. The fire code prevents this. Right, thank you so very much. Uh, building on what Professor Brewster was just recently talked about, I wanted to ask that, have there been instances in which you have had particular students who have come from a very, let's say, rigid political or ideological belief system in which they came to your classes and they may have said certain things which they find diametrically opposed to what the course content was or they have a political or they have a political belief system how have you been able to engage those students to at least think outside the box and have there been instances in which those particular students have been able to uh, reach a middle ground and try to at least temper or at least accept different uh, perspectives and to bring their whole worldview to be a bit more holistic than previous previously when they first came in thank you I don't know, like, I think that I have, um, you know, it's one of the things that I try to do is to use it in a mechanism that allows for talking about other groups. And so, like, if you make it not just about um, 
women or gay people or people of color or Muslim people, et cetera, and you're able to talk about it more holistically as in every single group. And so like that's one of the things that I try to do with the activity. And so sometimes like in lecture, like we'll talk about discrimination or we'll talk about prejudice or we'll talk about stereotypes and we will only focus on the privileged groups, right? So that they can see that like everyone is experiencing it. The degree is very different, you know, um, depending on your identity. Etc. But I don't think I'm successful a lot of times, right? Like I think that you know, teaching teaching sexuality and society in Morgantown, West Virginia, is not the easiest thing to do. And typically, what happens is it ends up being a classroom where like seven out of ten people are like so progressive that they make me look conservative, right? And then. Yeah. There's like three people who are like at this end of the spectrum. And so like it's a juggle sometimes to have to like, I, I just had this a few weeks ago where literally someone attacked another student verbally because they got the acronym wrong for LGBTQ. And I'm just like, come on, like give me a break, right? Like, you know, as a, as a gay faculty member, like once you get past a certain level, letter, it becomes difficult, right? And, <laughs> um, and they were like LGBTQIA, and then the next one was Miss. Someone like immediately jumped and attacked. And it was just like, hey, 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 right? Like, and it's funny because like a lot of times the students who jump and attack aren't even the best students, right? It's like the ones who think that they are, mm. right? That, that they think that they're this authority, but just a lot of times they're not. Uh, one of the techniques I use, and this is perfect in my realm, uh, in law, you can't act without evidence. And I will tell every single one of my students, you're allowed to have your beliefs. I'm not going to change your beliefs. My objective up here is not to change your beliefs. You're allowed to have them. However, in our world, if you act without evidence, you're going to be sued. You're going to be fired. You're not going to have a position. You're going to engage in constitutional violations. I said, no, 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 no. I said, so here's the deal. You can have your belief, but if you're going to come to me with that belief and you're going to posit said belief, you need to be able to support said belief with evidence. Because if you can't, then why should I provide any credence whatsoever to your belief? And I translate that to our world of criminal justice. If you come to me with a belief, I'm happy you got your belief, but if you don't have reasonable suspicion, probable cause, clear and convincing or beyond a reasonable doubt, I'm not budging. And so I try and put it on that parallel plane, and that seems to work with them. Another thing I do, and this is outside of the classroom, I tell the students that if you have and you want to debate, come talk to me. And what I will do is that professional debate that I talk about and that modeling of professional discourse, I'll have them come to my office. And we'll sit down during office hours, and I will openly debate with them and go back and forth and teach them professional discourse during my office hours if I have to. And it gets very entertaining because I am very liberal, and we work in a very conservative area in Kaiser, West Virginia. So a lot of the times with the students, they have very conservative principles and backgrounds. And the one thing I figured out is don't disrespect. Don't look down ever. Be open, be willing to receive, but at the exact same time, put the onus on them. Because if you want to convince me, you need to support your argument with substance. And that's how I get it to work. And then I treat them professionally. They treat me professionally. We model that discourse. and. Well, most of the time, life is good. <laughs> I, I want to keep this conversation going because I know that Gwen would have an answer for this question, but we're going to keep us on schedule. That's my job above all. I thank you for being here today. I thank the panelists for being here today. Many of them will be around for the rest of the day, if not for a very long time on campus, and you should seek out their advice. Thank you. Thank you.